at what? Okay, cool. I have to wait for my little timer to start in the corner so I know. Oh. <laughs> uh, episode 51, I am here with the folks of Ready's Rainforest. And I put in the little blurb like I usually do when, when I want to talk about folks that I'm going to interview. Uh, I was super interested to talk to you guys in part because you were referred to me from the Reptile Gumbo folks and the Herps Show folks and, and everybody on that circuit. Uh, you're the chameleon people they refer me to. So that was really cool. Uh, and I really like seeing what you guys are doing uh, on your social media. It's really awesome, the chameleons that you produce. Um, but I put in there that I have actually interviewed someone who does chameleons uh, in Pennsylvania. And so yeah. I was very interested to hear about the differences in keeping them in different parts of the country. Because a lot of folks, when they think about chameleons, you know, they're advanced, quote unquote, they're more difficult and all these different things. And then you talk to certain keepers and they're like, oh, I have this system. It works great. I'm good to go. You know, you guys have an awesome setup behind you. It looks super great, you know, and then you talk to somebody in a different part of the country and none of those things match or these parameters are different or, you know, things change just because of where they live. Uh, I thought it was really cool that I had seen for following your social media and, and seeing the show circuit and things like that. I had seen your successes and they're very similar to other folks who live in totally different environments in the United States. So I was very interested to hear about that. Um, but that's, there's a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so, um, to start out, can you guys introduce yourselves and let us know what Reddy's Rainforest does? <laughs> My name is Amanda Reddy. So Reddy is our last name and that's why we chose Reddy's Rainforest. And then this is... I'm Lee Reddy. <laughs> uh, I handle a lot of the, uh technical things, I guess, and, and raising the chameleons as far as like gut load, nutrition, stuff like that. He's into more of like supplements and, you know, really getting all that stuff, you know, more than me. I'm basically the caregiver of everybody and I, you know, like to work with each animal individually to, you know, get them handleable and lovable and, you know, I feed them every day, but he's the one that makes sure that they're as healthy as they can be. Very cool. That's a that's a very specific division of labor. Yeah. It, like, well, and like when I talk to folks that keep animals like chameleons, um, I don't necessarily think chameleons are advanced, whatever that means. I think chameleons take or things like chameleons, they just take more time or like more attention, right? Like a, a snake or something people feed once a week, keep it clean. It's all good, you know. Lizards are always more involved than snakes. It's just kind of their thing. And then you start to talk about something like chameleons. It's every day. I check my timers. I have my lights and misters. It's just more detail, I suppose. And so. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's really like what we try to tell people, you know, and they're like, oh, no, they're too hard, you know, and it's like, no, really, it's not that they're hard. They're just specific. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like you can't put an isopod in sand. You know, so you couldn't put a chameleon in an aquarium, you right. know, so it's like that's really all it is. It's just those few little certain things that, you know, have to be done for them versus, yeah, a snake that, you know, lives in a drawer, you know, and right. eats once a week. It's like, yeah, these, you know, when they're adults, you can go every other day, every couple of days because it is still a reptile. So it can handle, you know, a little bit of all pans but yet they do have to have the misting and all that stuff and the lights but whereas like a snake is in a drawer so For but sure. you know basically we try to tell people they can be automated you know you can if miss king you know going off twice a day for you the lights come on and off for you really the only thing that you're you're doing is feeding them you know so it's mm -hmm. it can be automated just not anything like a snake <laughs> right so looking at your social media, um, cause I'm a nerd for that. And I, uh, <laughs> you like to troll a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, and, well, and I always think it's cool because like, I, I don't personally know you guys and the guests that I don't personally know that that's always how this happens. Like my friends refer like, Oh, these people are cool. They do chameleon. Like 
this is who you should check out, you know, and that's how I find bunches of people. Um, so if you scroll back far enough on your Instagram, <laughs> uh, yeah. there's a point that says, uh, like getting back into the hobby, getting into reptiles. And, and before that there's hot rods and other things that also interest me. So I kept scrolling. <laughs> um, so at some point going back in living in Texas, though, you pick chameleons end up going down this route. Why, why does it go that way? Why tropical? Why chameleons? Um, push honestly, chameleons was our first reptile. We never owned anything else before that other than your typical dog, cat, you know, okay. that type of thing. It was, it, chameleons was the first thing we even started with. And it was a panther chameleon. And I mean, if I went and told you the real full story, it was I walked into a PetSmart one day, you know, they sell chameleons. Now they're not panthers, they're veiled. Yep. But I saw one sitting in there and I thought, wow, that thing looks so cute. I didn't know that this even existed, you know, and this was in like 2008, I think, something like that. Okay. And I went home and you know i'm a capricorn he's a capricorn so we researched researched all that figured it out found a really good breeder that makes you, know, you good nerds we, though that's good yeah we're big time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it takes us you know sometimes three or four days to purchase an item in our cart on amazon we're like no we got to research it more you know oh, you sound very that, familiar yeah yeah and it'll be something dumb you know it's not even anything like it has to do with this it'll be dumb and it'll take us days to buy it yeah. you know but we've got a hold of a really great breeder that they're not in it anymore but we ended up bringing home you know they shipped us a little you know three month old chameleon brown little stick and the feet if you've ever held a chameleon yep. the feet i mean that right there is like Oh my God, you know, the, the way their feet feel, they're holding you, you know, they're so strong and it was just, I have to have these animals, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then the, the localities of like Panther chameleons really fascinated me. I've always been fascinated with like genetics, you know, even through high school and stuff like that. It just interested me a lot. And then when we started, uh, getting into the chameleons you know everybody's like oh you live in texas they're you know that's that's a desert well it's not a desert <laughs> yeah. it's actually very humid here <laughs> yeah i mean you know relative humidity in our house is like 40 percent is, is okay and that's everybody's house you know that's not just because we happen to have like misters going off all the time to create that it's right. just you know, here in Texas, like it's humid out there right now today. I mean, it was uh, shirts were sticking while we were hunting for eggs. <laughs> okay. Know? So, and we live in North Texas, so not even South Texas. And it's pretty humid here. So it's like, I, I like to sell chameleons to people in the South. Cause I'm like, you know, we almost have the perfect condition for them. And you wouldn't think we do. Minus the heat. Outside. Minus the heat. Yeah. 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 Right. But for sure. Wise, you know, it's there, you know, it yeah. helps you out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And and our way of raising, you know, I mean, we, we, we do things simple over here and it's worked great for us for 14 years. I mean, we, we've done, we've changed with the times as far as like going from T8 bulbs to T5 bulbs. Uh, okay. high output T5 bulbs seem to do a lot better in the UBB index, you know, the Ferguson zones. For sure. Uh, and then, like, supplementation has gotten way better. When, when we first got into it, uh, it was Repcal with D3. Yep. Pink label. Uh, high IUs of D3 in there. And then uh, Herptivite. And there was no preformed vitamin A's in that. A lot of people were getting vitamin A issues. And, and we weren't. And what I didn't... I, didn't realize I was doing, but I was making a dry gut load with preformed vitamin A's in it to feed the bugs, and then the bugs were consuming the preformed vitamin A and oh. millions. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, see, he likes that part. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, panther chameleons in, in general, 
and then localities and then just the idea for chameleons with insect feeders and gut load like if if you are a person who enjoys the research aspect of it like that that's just such a rabbit hole that you can go down for oh, yeah. all those different things yeah nutrition is in our opinion nutrition is the biggest key to their life is it's nutrition yeah, the, the chameleon is actually very simple to take care of they, they got basic needs you meet those basic needs uh now the bugs are a different story yeah you know, i, I tell the, everybody the bugs are harder to take care of than the chameleons they, they are <laughs> they for are, sure the, the feeders are you know they're a little more time consuming you know you want to switch up the gut loads you want to offer different nutritional values you know you don't want to offer the same cheeseburger every day yeah. to, mm -hmm. to an animal you know, you, you always want to be varying the diet, not just in feeder species, but also gut content, because that transfers to the chameleon. So you you guys post quite a bit about that, actually, uh, which I thought was awesome. And how did you come to the dry mix that you use when you're gut loading along with like the fruits and vegetables and stuff? So the, the dry mix, uh, I talked with a guy uh, he helped us out a lot. After we got our first pair of chameleons, uh, I got in contact with a guy that lived in Madagascar for like 30 years. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, he noticed that a lot of the chameleons' contents and, and their stomachs and stuff, when he'd find a dead chameleon, you know, he, he'd do like a, a necropsy over there. And he saw a lot of grains and, and fibrous material in there. And he knows that they're not eating that directly because there was a lot of insects in there. Grasshoppers, their forms of crickets, beetles. And uh, I started thinking about it and I was like, well, you know, they sell this cricket food, but it's really high in protein. It's not really mm -hmm. nutritional. It's just to, meant to keep the cricket alive. What if I just take that and apply it to the chameleon's health instead? And so I was talking with uh, the guy over there in Madagascar, and he was explaining, you know, how they, how some of the agricultural areas growing, you know, the leafy greens, and uh, you know they're surrounded by ocean, you know, so there's like kelps and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to kind of introduce a little bit at a time here and see how the animal reacts. And uh, we, I bury that dry mix all of the time, but. Uh, I basic uh, I base it a little bit off our nutritional factors, what humans, you know, what what it's reading on the scales, and then what I think the chameleon would benefit from, like B vitamins, uh, fat soluble vitamin A's, uh, calcium, always high calcium. Uh, high calcium really isn't good for the bug, but it's great for the chameleon. Right. Very and, cool. And so that, that's how we kind of started doing the dry grain mixtures and stuff like that. And I try to post it up every once in a while when I do a new mix. I don't do it all the time. I should do it more. But I like to post pictures of what we're gut loading. So, so it helps people that maybe follow us or are... Like somebody who's bought from us. Right. Even you know, bought from us. You know, or somebody that's just, just out there looking at chameleons. They come across our page and they're like, oh, well, they're feeding something. Their chameleons look healthy. Great. Take that idea and use it. Yeah. Because, because it's only going to it's only gonna benefit the animal. For sure. Very cool. Uh, Tiffany in the chat asked what that dry mix consists of. Uh, uh, yeah. So the base, the, the, the base is going to be alfalfa leaves, uh, that's okay. usually 50% of the base. And then we'll do some bee pollen. You can do some seaweed or kelp, uh, try to find the uh, no salt, uh, Burge yeast. Let's see. What else is there? There's, um, dandelion, uh, dandelion root, dandelion leaves, uh, dried. And uh, then hibiscus. hibiscus leaves and hibiscus flowers dried. Uh, you can purchase these. Some of it I dry myself, just okay. so I, just so I know it's you know you can buy organic and be safe. Um, then there's let's see, I put a lot in that mix. That last <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
like uh, the Irish Head Brewer's yeast. Well, I do know you've posted a couple of recipes on Instagram as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. And then there's like flaxseed. Flaxseed's a great fiber, you know, grind, grind that up. Anybody, you can get flaxseed meal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can get some, I, I don't really like to do this because it makes it spool quicker, but if you're making small batches, you can do some dried non-salted vegetables or fruit okay. in there to get the, the feeders really enticed to eat it. And as long as the nutritional value is there, I mean, if, if you're picking up a fruit and it's all it has is sugar listed on the nutritional values, don't don't feed it. Right. Very cool. Like I said, lots of details, <laughs> uh, which I think is awesome. But we end up scaring people, you know, whenever yeah. they come up and talk to us because we can like spit it out, you know, like word vomit to them. And they're like, wait, wait, what, what? And we're like, look, you don't have to know this now. You know, we're just telling you, right. you know, that you can know this for the future. This is information we've collected over 14, 15 years of doing it. Yeah. For sure. And, uh, a lot of it's just back to the basics, you know, you know, taking care of. What takes care of the animal, which are they're an insectivore. So take care of the bug, it takes care of the chameleon. I always tell you know? people, look at your bug as an empty pill pocket, just an empty empty capsule with nothing in it. So whatever you put into that bug is gonna go into your animal. So the healthier that bug is, the healthier your animal is gonna be. Absolutely. That's just the best way to look at it. Nice. So you guys uh, have posted a couple of videos uh, putting together enclosures uh, and you have awesome looking enclosures behind you. And I know you talk quite a bit about you like to keep simplistic, keep things simple, easy to clean, uh, that type of thing. And so what, so like the, one of the most recent Instagram videos I was watching, uh, you were using the, the fake plants from Michael's easy to clean dowel rods, very simple step-by-step -step instructions. What pushed you to go that way as opposed to live plants, so on and so forth? We've actually never used live yeah. other than yeah. in the Parsons cage, which you might've saw in the really old Instagram post. <laughs> it did but, and it was huge uh, and awesome. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, we've never actually used live plants. We've always used fake. We consider ourselves sterile raisers is, you know, what some people have coined the term is we raise sterile, not naturalistic. Okay. And, and the main reason why we do that is because you want to worry about the animal, not the plants. I want to take know? care of the animal, not the cage. And, and then, and some plants, you know, people are like, oh, well, my, my hibiscus is dying. Well, because it's getting overwatered or it's getting underwatered, you know. So now you're worried about the plant instead of the animal. Or, right. or you know, it, it needs to be fertilized, but I can't use a fertilizer. Well, what do I use? You use crushed up pecans. That works really well. I know how to do it. I opt not to do it because I feel like the health of the animal is more important to me than taking care of a plant. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, now, if you're talking belds, you know, belds do eat foliage. Yeah. I mean, it's not really a good thing. I, I personally think it's possibly some kind of deficiency is why it may be doing that. But panthers are not really known to eat plants. Some people have said right. they do, but I have never seen it out of having wild caught animals, captive bred animals. I've never seen them munching on the leaves. I think that honestly, that's a deficiency. You know, they're looking for something that they're not getting yeah. and, or they're thirsty, yeah. you know, and they're thinking, well, maybe there's some water on this leaf, you know, that I can't see, but it's never happened to us. I mean, I'm not going to say it won't ever happen, but it hasn't yet. And we just like to be able, we do deal with wild caught. Now we isolate them, but we want to be able to sterilize that cage during their treatment. And you can't do that to a live plant. You know, I can't right. put, you know, peroxide and bleach and boiling water on a live plant, you know, like I can on a fake plant. 
for sure. And I, this way, you know, like in these cages, you know, I can monitor these babies' poop, you know, make sure that everybody's, because the bottoms are paper towels, mm-hmm. you know, and I can monitor, make sure everybody's doing okay and, you know, everybody's looking good. And we run regular fecals on everybody. And it's like, if what if that fecal matter fell into the dirt and then some bug from the dirt or whatever got into it and then contaminated it, then I can't get a good fecal off of it. Right. And just, there's, you know, pros to, you know, fake plants, I think. There's more pros than there are cons. It's just in the chameleon world, everybody thinks you have to have a live plant. And it's like, well, it's not then, necessary. It's not necessary. I mean, well, I mean, each chameleon's different, and if your chameleon is chewing on plants, you need to look at your hydration, and you need to look at your gut load, your your gut load, and your supplementation schedule, yeah. because more than likely, one of those three is going to be off. Yeah, it's missing something. In uh, its diet. You know, but I mean. I, I, Knock on wood. I mean, I've never, I've, I've never had an impaction from fake plant plants. Yeah. So I'm, right. I'm sure that's from random people having bad experiences and expressing it out into the community. Yeah. And I, I get, you know, there there is a risk, but there's a risk with live plants as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can take uh, organic soil and you mix it up, and then you have it in a potted plant, and like the Parsons we had back in the day, I do routine fecals on him. One time I did a fecal sample. I picked it up out of the dirt out of his potted plant and I floated it and I saw a bunch of nematodes, roundworms in there. And I was like, well, this isn't right. You know, he, he's been clean. And so what it was is it wasn't a chameleon or a or reptile nematode. It was a dirt type nematode for some other species. Oh. Okay. And so then it, you know, it makes you second guess yourself and you're running around and trying to. And then to, it's like, what if you treat that animal and that medication ends up killing them? You know, I mean, chameleons are so sensitive with medicine. Yes, it's, for it's sure. Like, you know, that if honestly, that's the hardest part about them is they just don't tolerate medicine. Well, mo- most of it can be fixed without medicine. Without medicine. Uh, other than parasites. Yeah. Parasites need, need to be ridded i mean now you are feeding bugs so there is always the possibility of a reinfection you know but their immune system as long as you have a healthy chameleon they can control that or rid it from their system for sure and i did see in the video where you guys were putting together an enclosure uh you were pretty specific with your uh, plant choices and you showed folks that you had some like more like cloth type and that you preferred um, the more plasticky, shiny. And then you were talking about how, as you were using the misters, it helped with hydration, it collected water better and different things. Is that trial and error thing? You just got that over time that you found one type to be better? Well, I mean, the silk plants, since they're in, they're under the UVB lights, you know, those silk plants kind of, I guess, deteriorate almost, you know, because it's like oh. out in the sun, you know, okay. like your reef on your front door gets kind of like burnt looking, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it breaks down. And okay. we've just noticed that the more plastic type feeling tends to hold up a little bit better to like the lighting. And oh. so then, yeah, we notice that silk really, it almost absorbs water like a towel you know, versus leaving like little water droplets on the plastic, you know, okay. kind. and then, yeah, you know, even like in these cages, you know, some of them are kind of like little cups, you know, that they kind of hold little water droplets, you know, and the chameleons will go up and see it and, you know, drink out of it almost like a little cup. Very cool. So speaking of the enclosures behind you um, <laughs> and your setups, uh, you guys also have posted that you kind of have progressed over time uh, and you showed some different setups from herp shows and, and different things that you've gone through and kind of came to the setup we see behind you now. Uh, is that something where, is that a specific brand that you prefer or how, how did you, how did that come to be with that? Cause it, it looks much narrow, but deep and tall is what it yeah. looks like 
it kind of it's behind you but you get yeah. the idea <laughs> uh, so a friend of ours actually ordered these in and uh, okay I purchased a few from them just to try out and I think I got 10 from them I think so in the beginning yeah. and and instantly saw saw a benefit from them uh, the chameleons were roaming around more they were they were uh, felt more secure you know they, they, they could go and hide if they wanted to because of the depth you know all the neonates and the, and the young babies and stuff like that they still have a fear because they are they're young you know everything is out to eat them <laughs> so uh, I got these because I wanted to add more security more safety for the babies so as okay. they grow they, they, they still felt secure you know they eat they drink. They they did the same in the older, smaller enclosures, but this does a lot better, you know. Okay. And, and so that's the reason why. And it's dragon dragon den chameleon. Dragon den dragon den chameleon. Yeah, out of okay. Waco. And uh, oh, okay. He, he, he gets a very limited supply. Uh, I think he's fixing to get some more in, uh, but they usually don't last long. <laughs> <laughs> very cool a lot, a lot of people like uh it's great for crested geckos the the, the enclosure you know uh, oh yeah we had some uh eyelash viper breeders come up to us and ask where they came from because they were gonna get them and they replaced the screen with acrylic on the front yeah i could see that for sure yeah and yeah. i was like hey there's there's multiple uses for them so uh, th this is just one application that we have here very cool so um doing the shows uh in that type of thing is that something like that that type of enclosure where like i would it would kind of stress me out because like with chameleons it's one of those things where like i want them to be able to feel safe and do their own thing and get away from your big monkey hands but <laughs> I kind of need you to see it so you can maybe want to buy it because I'm here at a show. <laughs> so, like, how do you, how do you kind of, uh, well, like, I don't know if you can see, I don't, like, let me, I don't know if you can see. Who can you see? Oh, yeah. So, this one, do you see him right here? Oh, yeah. In there? I mean, you can see through it, you know, in the video. Now, this one's sitting right here in the front. In the video, you know, it's not the same as, you know, at a show, because I can see everybody staring at me right now. They're all looking, all the top yeah. rows looking down at us, like, what are y'all doing in here? Looking for food. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're not feeding us, you know, but you can see in them quite well. I mean, at a show, it's a little different, you know, because in person, I can see them clear as day. Right. And you so, know? when the setup gets them, so, so the setup is impressive. I feel, or I feel like we set up a very impressive display of chameleons. Whenever somebody walks up to our table, then they ask questions. And then when we go and when they're asking questions, well, now we can discuss chameleons with you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we can have that conversation instead of them just coming, walking by, trying to get a sneak peek. I, I love talking to chameleons, even if you're not going to purchase a chameleon from me. <laughs> I, I do, yeah, I just, we'll talk to you all day long about chameleons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a passion of both of us. Mm -hmm. We we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't love it so much. Yeah. You know? yeah. But I mean, honestly, we set them up like this at shows too because mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been to a show and seen. Usually, chameleons are just in deli cups and they're yeah. all black and their eyes are sunken in and they're all scratching to get out. When yeah. we go to shows, these will eat. They will drink, they're basking, they're walking around, they're being active, you know, they're just living life in it. They don't even know any different. You know, they just occasionally see somebody walk in front of the cage and, oh, you know, and I mean, they'll sit there and eat right in front of them and people are just blown away. Oh my God, your chameleon's eating at a show, you know, well, because it feels safe, right. you know, and it's not crammed in a deli cup. I hate seeing them in the deli cups. <laughs> it's yeah. like that, you know, brutal to, yeah. yeah. You know, so this way, and we bring their lights, you know, and everything, and they're they're able to just walk around, you know, and they don't have a problem with, you know, anything really. And if they've had enough, they go back towards the back of the cage. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody right. will, somebody may walk up like, well, I want to see that one in the back of the cage. I'm like, well, make a trip around the show. Yeah. 
and then and then come back and I'm I'm willing to bet he just he just needed a break. He needed a break. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. So he he walked back to the back of the cage, and then by the time they come back around, guess what? Make a millions at the front of the cage. Yeah. And ours, you know, we literally raise them as soon as they come out of the egg. You know, they see my face, his face, our daughter's face. You know, they see us. We feed them every single day. You know, we check them over. I take them out, look, make sure everybody's doing good. You know, I mean, and they're so they're very used to humans. And, you know, we get messages all the time. You know, even though we tell people when they get a new one, leave them alone for a couple of days because that cage is new. Everything's new. But you now they message us. They're like, they just ate out of our hand. Oh, my God. You know, and it's like, well, yep. I mean, you know, I, it's because ours are pretty social. We always get lots of messages about, well, they don't like being in their cage. They just get happy whenever I hold them. Well, I, you know, they're just social. You know, yeah. like ours, our babies are pretty known for being social. We, we offer a variety of feeders, you know, and it's always keeping them intrigued, mm -hmm. right? So, so what's right. next? What's the next feeder, yeah. you know? Yeah, because people will message us, well, what have you offered them? Because I don't know what to do. They have been exposed to almost everything yeah. by the time they go home to you. No, you no, know? no mealworms. Yeah, no mealworms, though. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't feed any mealworms. If you're going to feed any, any worm like that, feed a super worm mm -hmm. and make sure it's gut loaded well. You could mix our, you could grind up our dry gut load mix and use that as their bedding. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We don't use any of the like substrate weird, like wood chip well, type. Wheat, well, yeah, yeah. Most, most of it's wheat bran is yeah. what it is. And wheat, wheat bran is great for fiber, but no, no it's other nutritional nothing. value. Yeah. So we yep. use literally our dry gut load as our super worm bedding. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, superworms are a great feeder for chameleons. Everybody, you know, like says, no, you can't feed superworms. No, you can feed superworms. Mm -hmm. It's it's the nutritional value of the superworm. So, but can you feed only superworms? Uh, probably not. Nothing wants to eat the same thing every day. You know, <laughs> right. Always mix it up. Even it, you know, do dubias. If if you're wanting a convenient feeder, do the dubias. Mm -hmm. But with dubias, you got to worry about uric acid buildup. Once the nymph starts getting closer to adulthood, it yeah. stores uric acid as protein. So and then you end up with a chameleon with gout. Right. So oh. so you need to feed younger nymphs of dubias. So to offset that, feed younger nymphs of dubias and feed silkworms. Yep. And it's it's a little balance, and I mean every insectivore lizard would benefit from that. It's not just chameleons. You know, a variety of feeders for any animal, you're getting a different nutritional factor. Oh, variety is the spice of life. Just, that's all it is. <laughs> well, and, and that's that's kind of the thing with when people think advanced and chameleons and they get freaked out or whatever. And it's one of those things where it's like, well, it's not necessarily difficult. Like, you just had to stop and think for a second. Like, yeah. well... What about superworms? And it's like, okay, well, just don't keep them on straight brand. Like you got to vary the diet and do, yeah, like yeah. the the things that you're saying. Like it's not a, a complex thing. It's just that like if you're new, you didn't know that, you know, and you heard never superworms, and then you see some guy with a superworm, you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't right. make any. And it's like, no, dude, just two steps. You know, <laughs> like it's yeah. a little yeah. bit different gut load or, or what have you. Know, and same thing for folks that. You know, you, you're just going to go to the pet store and get dubia and chuck them in there because you have, you know, a leopard gecko or something that doesn't care. And it's yeah. like, well, no, the, the same thing is true. It, it doesn't have to be a chameleon. It could, you know, any lizard, or if you don't know that about the life stages of certain roaches, if you don't know that about, you know, using silkworms to balance things out and stuff like it's not necessarily just a chameleon thing. It just is that I think they probably present it a little faster. And that, you know, when you see gout and you see problems, people are already like the keepers are already a little nervous. And so then it starts to look weird and it's like, oh, I totally screwed up and it's a chameleon. And, you know, they're, they're already a little on edge as opposed to like, yeah, I gave my crested gecko a roach. Then it was weird. I don't know. But they're derby anyway. Like it's the attitude, I guess, isn't the same. People are a little more high strung about chameleons. Yeah, chameleons, it's, you know, they get that rumor of they're made of glass. Yeah, and, you know? they, and they get hyper fixated about yeah. a little thing that's probably not even a, a thing or a problem. It's just, 
that day the chameleon isn't feeling very hungry or feeling very thirsty. They're like, oh, well, he's not drinking, so he's going to die. Yeah. No, that's that's not how it works. You know, they're still a resilient animal. Some of our wild caught yeah. just imagine what that animal went through, all the way from Madagascar to my to my house. Yeah, I mean, on a boat and yeah. That animal survived that whole trip, and then came, got put in my cage, and then I'm sitting here looking at it, going, "Okay, you're a little dehydrated. Uh, let's worry about hydration and food." Let's see what happens. They may not eat for a week or two. Well, okay, so I'm still going to meet your, pri your your parameters. You know, I'm going to offer you proper lighting and offer the water, the mistings. Yeah. And, and uh, just leave them alone. And usually after a week or two, they, they you know, they get brighter. They, get, they start drinking. They're starting to acclimatate. And then this chameleon that was plucked 30 days ago in Madagascar from the wild is all of a sudden thriving in my care because I had a little patience. Yep. That's it's I mean with chameleons you don't get as long as yeah, leopard gecko does. You know, you don't get as long of error time. But right. it is there. You know, and it's like if you'll know your chameleon, like me, since I deal with more of them on the care level, I'll I'll see one animal one day and I'm like, you know what, Lee, this one's just acting weird to me. You know, something's going on. And he'll go, okay, now let's do a fecal. Let's figure this out. Let's see what's wrong with it. You yep. know, and then he usually can figure it out. You know what, we need to give him a boost of this or a boost of that. And But at me, I noticed it, I guess, I call it the spiritual level. You know, I noticed they're just not feeling good, you know. I can tell, I can feel that they're not feeling good. And then he will try to figure out what is it, you know? Right. And it's like keepers could notice it once they learn their animal, yeah. you know, learn your animal. Your animal's going to tell you, I don't feel good today. You know, okay, well, why don't you feel good? Let's see why, you know, yeah, it's, so it's a time thing. Just spending that time. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, we, oh, we try to keep people out of the vet is, as much as we can because since they're so sensitive to medicine it's like that's usually yeah the vet's like let me pump you full of all this medicine that goes for a bearded dragon you know and chameleons just can't handle it right. when yeah, they, most of the time you can do it at home yeah a lot of it can sometimes a vet, a vet, a vet is to, needed is needed but but literally. but you gotta find that special vet that you know the there, one vet that we all there, love. there's a <laughs> guy named rob coke it's yeah. in San Antonio. I think he runs the reptile area in the zoo there. And uh, he's been on a couple of times. And I've, I've heard him talk. And that man is very intelligent when it comes to chameleons. And he is amazing in what research he has done just on his own, you know, about mm -hmm. chameleons. And that that's the type of vet you want to try to find. You don't want you, if, if you need a vet. But a lot of but a lot of the chameleon problems aren't really vet related. It's more of there's there's something that you're just not doing. Are you feeding empty feeders? Yep. You know, are they bored of that feeder tasting the same? Uh, you know, are are your lights off? You know, because they they are they are a daytime species. They like to bask. They like to fill that UV. Yeah. Uh, and some people, you know, I see them, they'll, uh, uh, like on Craigslist, they'll have this chameleon cage with one heat dome on there, a mercury vapor bulb with yeah, 120 watt on there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm like, that's not, that's, you know, you've got to think of how they exist in the wild. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're shade dwellers. They, they actually go to the shaded area and move out into the sun. So, so they need both in, a, in an enclosure. They, they need to be able to get out of it and get into it. If, if, if they're in it all day long and they have no access to get out of it, well, then the chameleon is going to show a little stress. Yeah. And it, it's not complicated. It's a it's, it's very simple way of thinking, I guess, for us. And I, I try to get our customers or anybody to kind of just take a step back. Don't believe everything you've heard about chameleons. And let me talk to you for a minute. You know, it, <laughs> yep. it, it, it's a lot to take in, but it's really not a lot. It's all basic knowledge. You know, yep. we, we know how they act in the wild. 
you know, uh, their, their thriving time of the year in Madagascar is the rainy season. That's when the babies hatch and all this stuff because they have a, so their winter isn't cold, but it's dry. So they have a dry, which is their winter, a dry season, and then a wet season, which is their summer. Yep. So they have two seasons like that. So most of the time the hatching and stuff like that happens in the wet season. And that's kind of how I based my misting schedules, my lighting, my UVB index, all that off, all that off of, is for the prime time of life in that country, which, you know, is usually an 85 degree basking spot. Seems to be on point. And then uh, uh, I'll do a three and a 3.5 Ferguson reading on the UVB on the adults, but on the okay. babies, I only do a two. The reason why I do a two is because the, the man I knew in Madagascar said that most of the baby chameleons he saw over there were in low-lying bushes in the shade protecting oh. predators right okay and, and then they and then bugs would come around the base of those bushes and shrubs to drink the sap or the berries that dropped off it and that's how they were eating their little beetles their little oh. uh, little gnats and yeah. grasshoppers and stuff like this okay so you, you know a, a baby chameleon i'm sure you could blast it with three three and a half uh, on the UVB scale, but it's not needed for a neonate and a baby because they're all they're heavily concerned with surviving in the wild. So I feel like that's yeah. just as important in captivity. So the UVB index needs to be lower. Very cool. That is, I mean that makes perfect sense once you say it out loud. But yeah, that's yeah, that's that's awesome. That's just, that's how we think about it is, is just be simple, you know, try to give them everything they need and give them everything they need in the best time of their life, which who isn't happy in the summer, you know, <laughs> I mean, so it's like, give them everything they have in the summer and, you know, cause some people run some caging methods that we're just really not a fan of and it's to simulate the dry season. And it's like, why would you do that whenever you could just give them the best in captivity instead of giving them, you know, well, we'll give them a dry season in captivity. Why? We don't have to. Well, yeah, there's, there's no benefit to it that we've seen. No. I, mean, I, I haven't seen one benefit to uh, trying to match the dry season and then the rainy season. There's no breeding difference. There's no food response difference. Uh, other than the chameleon seems a little less active, I guess, would be the difference. In the dry season, if we, if we offered a dry season, they seem a little more just like lazy, you know, not wanting to do as much. Okay. So, well, and we kind of notice that, like, some people will message or post on groups and think, why does my chameleon look so drab? They do get a little drab in the winter, you know, like their colors get right. a little bit duller, you know, and even though our homes are climate controlled, they feel the barometric pressure, you know, mm -hmm. they know, okay, yeah, it's winter, you know, let me just kind of be lazy, you know, put on this coat, you know, this old raggedy coat, <laughs> you yep. know, and just sit here and that's what they do you know they know they feel it yeah. you know they just but we don't have to simulate it right. you know they can just feel it with barometric pressure yeah and here in texas you know everybody says oh how are you raising chameleons in texas it's actually very I easy think it's easier down here in the south i don't know how people are doing in the north yeah that <laughs> or, yeah up north was probably pretty hard with your heaters running all the time and and yeah and, just yeah. dry air yeah yeah it's it's the dry it's the drying out when you're running heaters that's the the number one problem is you can you can maintain temperature no problem it's right. just it's people don't take into account the idea i'm a little different because i have a, a facility it's separate but like if you're at home like you, yeah you know oh, it's it's 75 in my house like what's the problem it's like you you just aren't accounting for the fact that your entire home is drier now like yeah. it's it, yeah it's, it's, it's definitely like, something to fight against yeah like we even we adjust the wattage in their basking bulbs you know to counteract the fact that you know our heater's on and then in the wind oh, okay. 
a little change the basking bowl because it's summertime and our air conditioner is blasting. Right. You know, so it's like we do pay attention to, you know, the basking temperatures and things because of our central heat and air, you know, but. And I, and I have some friends up north that rate raise chameleons and uh, I kind of gave them some tips and tricks that seem to help with their their room that they're keeping their chameleon in is uh so we like to keep our cages clean or the sterile raising so get you some live plants outside the the enclosure like in right? the room so in the room mm -hmm. uh yep. or if you have like a reptile room right uh you could mop the floor with just water before you go to bed at night and that'll give you your humidity spike you know Yep. Uh, very, very simple little things that would increase the humidity in that room, even though a heater is blowing. Yep. And like we, we're starting to honestly think we've always done it in the adult cages since they're on the Miss King system. We use puppy pee pads on the bottom instead okay. of paper towels. And if you know what a puppy pee pad is, it's basically a diaper. It's water crystals. You know, yeah, it's water crystals. You know, it catches mm -hmm. that moisture. And I'm thinking that must be creating some humidity, you know, that happens. Because, sure. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't never really dry out, you know, it stays wet, but yet it's not, you know, leaking water everywhere. Right. And, you know, we change them about once, twice a week, depending on, you know, if they mess in there or anything. But, you know, I'm thinking that's got to be helping it too. And it, with it being down on the bottom of the cages, you know, that, little bit of humidity can kind of rise up within the cages and we use all screen cages on the adults now the babies are in you know hybrid so screen and plastic but yeah with the hybrids okay. you have to worry about temperature mm -hmm. a little bit more with the hybrids especially oh parenting. okay because it's hot <laughs> because because it's a little hotter so i mean you know with them uh on the juveniles and neonates we don't offer a basking bowl we just do a 6500K and then a UVB bulb. Oh. Then I place layers of screen on to get to the UVB index I want. Oh, so, okay. So they don't actually get a incandescent bulb or a basking lamp. They get a linear 6500K bulb that actually produces almost the right amount of heat. Yeah, a little you bit know? of warmth for them, you know, so, so they're not cold or anything. Right, so they move cool. to the top of the cage if they want to get warm, and then they move out to the front or to the more to the lower branches of the cage to get more room temperature. And huh. that, that's how we deal with the hybrid cages, or the covered all three sides of a cage and just the top and front screen. Cool. So do you have a uh, preference for your UV lights, or do you go with anybody specific or are you just getting what you get and then go off your uv meter so uh i've, I've been running two brands and they they're basically identical it just it would be on what shade you like because they have two different shades of uva or or visible light coming out of them and that's the arcadia six percent and then okay. the reptisun 5.0 uh we've been using the reptisun 5.0 for 15 years and, wow and uh but they were t8s and then we transitioned to the t5s okay and uh the t5s are a lot stronger of a bulb even in the six percents in the arcadias so but they do ca they do cast a different color spectrum uh one's a little bluer than the other the arcadia seems to produce a little more of a blue light yeah oh. like in some of our show pictures, like you'll see in Chandler's cage, he's the adult we always take with us. Mm -hmm. His is almost like a blue haze that's casting in his cage versus like at home, it's more of a white, right. you know, light than it is like that blue shadowy look. And that's just the spectrum huh. on how the bulbs were built, mm -hmm. but they both, both seem to perform very well. Uh, wow. But with the T5 bulbs, you got to remember how strong they are. They are very strong, so right. you at least need to be six, eight inches away from that bulb at minimum, uh, either with your branch or elevating above your cage. And uh, if that's not enough, add a layer of screen in between the bulb and the screen cage, and that will drop the UV index a little bit too. Yeah. 
Very cool. So, but they're but they're both great bulbs. Uh, I actually have some Reptisuns that are going on three years. Three yeah. years. Uh, still reading the exact same UVB I had after firing them up for the first couple of days, getting them warmed up. They're still reading the exact same UVB reading. Wow. And it's usually not supposed to last like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, so so and usually they're supposed to be replaced yearly, but with a UVB meter, I mean, I think it's worth its weight in gold to us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Expensive, but it's like if you have anything at home that's a daytime animal, you know, a yep. bull living animal, you need to buy one. I mean, they're just, it's amazing. And then, uh, like the guys over there at uh, Rep Reptile Gumbo Podcast, uh, they're using Vivtex over there. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get a couple of Vivtex and I'm going to run them in these cages behind us. I want to I wanna see the difference in between an LED versus a linear. You know, I, I, I want to see the strength, the the light emitted. You know, I want to see how the animal reacts because it, it'd be great if we moved over the to the LED technology, if if it's there. You know, I, I don't right. know if it's quite there, but that would be my own personal testing, not not what kind of data I can read online. Oh yeah. Well, so I actually am kind of doing the same thing. Um, the thing about that I have found so far with that is um, it changes, for me at least, it changes how I set up enclosures. And so what I've always loved about chameleons and uh, day geckos and any number of things that are kind of set up similarly to the things behind you guys is linear lighting especially for uv makes stuff like that so convenient and yeah. and i really love that and it's, and like it's kind of a uniform thing you know what i mean like everybody kind of uses the same style of bulb about the same strength we all go like six to eight inches like we all kind of know the game for what we need to get started and I really love the VivTech stuff and I use it for a lot of high UV things for my like iguanids and uromastics and stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm setting up the enclosure totally different. And right. so it, it's one of those things where it's, yeah, it's, it's a really cool product. And then it, then it's about application. You know what I mean? Like, trying to make it fit what you guys have going on and, and, and how that works and, and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, because you, you want a cascade effect of the UVB index in the cage. You don't want just three and then a bunch of leaves covering it. You want them to be able to move down to the next stick and go to a two or two and a half or 2.7. They, they know what they need, you know, what they want to absorb. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're feeling in their bodies because I mean it's radiation that's what UVB is and uh, it's simulating the rays that comes off the sun but the chameleon's gonna know and if one thing that concerns me with the LEDs is that a lot of them I, I don't think there's a linear out there yet that I know of I think Vivtech's working on a linear but with the isolated one diode in the middle, you're concentrating all that into an isolated area. So how's that going to affect the animal? Because even though the whole cage is lit up, do they think they're getting UVB from just that spot? Or are they assuming their whole cage is getting UVB? So it ends up being, um, it's, it's a spotlight, but it kind of, you know, it's like a tiny flood bulb, like, you know, the old school mercury vapors where it's just a giant cone of insanity. Yeah. Um, same idea, but smaller and not nuclear. So, right. Um, and then it creates a cone effect, right? So it gets yeah. wide and less intense as it yeah. comes. But like you were saying, then you you got to have a meter to, to be able to, you know, set where you think you want everything to be. Um, yeah, it, when you're doing, I mean, honestly, it, it wouldn't matter any kind of light you use, but when you're doing animals like chameleons and, and things like that, you, you just kind of have to have one, like, the, yeah. in order to know well, what it is yeah. that you're doing. 
it, it's their eyes, you know. I mean, they're all eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, you don't want a UVB index of six or eight or anything like that. Yeah. You're with the animal that's only visual, you know, they, they don't use hearing. They don't use their taste to get or heat pits or anything like that. They, they use their eyes to move around, find feeders, drink, you know, interact, everything. So, so like back in the day, whenever they had those curly Q fluorescent, compact fluorescents, mm -hmm. and they had the UVC coming out of those. Yep. Uh, like 2010 time frame, everybody kept posting up, oh, my chameleon's blind now because of that bowl. Yeah. Yeah, those are bad news. And, you know, and it makes you wonder isolating down UVB to that tight of a beam. Yes, the higher you lift it, the wider the beam goes, but it's still a concentration. Mm -hmm. And on, on a tropical or a subtropical species, is that going to affect them different than, like, let's say you're a mastic that likes it hot? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm blasting stuff on purpose. <laughs> you know, they're, they're looking for it. Yeah. Yeah, see, like, your mastics are amazing. I, I love those those lizards. That, that's, that was one of my favorite desert species to, to mess with. We had uh, ornates back in the day. Oh, cool. And uh, they lived on millet. You know, that, that's what we were told back in the day. You know, is they live on millet, and then they you feed them greens and don't water them unless you give them water and then remove it. Mm hmm is the, is the way that we were told to raise them. Old and, school. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, they thrive with us. You know, I mean, I'm sure husbandry has changed on them. I haven't looked at them in the past 10 years. But I'm, I'm sure husbandry has changed. Lighting has changed on them. You know, maybe even dietary changes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it's... I always think stuff like that's hilarious where we look at it now and it's like... What were we doing? <laughs> but then you look at pictures and it's like, I don't know, man. Some of the lizards look really good. Like we can't have been we can't have been that bad. That's know? it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's yeah. us. You know, it's like with some of these, you know, new techniques with chameleons, it's like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You right. know? Yeah. I mean Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for that. Yeah, I mean, and we hear it all the time. People walk up and with Chandler at shows and Chandler's actually one of our smaller males. And he's just smaller naturally, I guess. Just a but yeah, he's just more on the petite side. But people come up and see him and they're oh my god, that chameleon is so huge. And I'm like, What? When I look at him, I see little, you know, right. in comparison to these other males that are next to him and you know, people he's huge and I'm like, Okay, it's it's got to be something that we're just doing. You well, know, it's it's a, it's a healthy chameleon. Yeah, you know, yeah. A, a lot of people don't get that experience. We're we're trying to change the narrative whenever we go to a show. Everybody that sees all these wild caught, fresh imported chameleons, you know, they see a, a lethargic or, or stressed out animal. We want to show you the opposite side of that: yeah. an actively feeding, drinking, uh, bright eyed, walking around. Uh, interactive animal and I, I think that's where they're thinking oh wow look at that big animal is they're, they're really saying wow look at that healthy chameleon yeah, yeah for sure I have definitely agree <laughs> um, so I am interested with chameleons in general it I come across or I seem to come across folks that are really into chameleons um tend to breed them yeah. and i have always thought of that as like a lot of chameleons as far as lizards go or reptiles in general they have weird life cycles in that a lot of times they're shorter lived or they live in incredibly harsh places or sometimes they have really weird things with their egg development and Madagascar is a crazy place. So like, there's a lot of really odd things with chameleons. Um, and so it just seems that people who get really into them like that, that it almost seems to be like a natural progression of it is that they end up breeding them because 
you get so into it, you learn so much, you have so many details and so much knowledge about this. And then it's like year six or seven, and now you need another chameleon. Is <laughs> you like it? Whereas I have I have a super diverse collection. We have all sorts of stuff because we do shows, and and we do have some things that have shorter lifespans. Um, but then we have tortoises, or I have a rhinoceros iguana, or you know I have things that are. 20 25 years old that are just getting going and it's i guess it's a little bit different mentality i suppose we're like i don't i don't feel a need to reproduce my tortoise because he just now figured out what girls are and he's 23 like you know i mean so i i'm not worried about you know what am i what am i gonna do when he's not here he's going in my will so i won't know <laughs> you know um <laughs> Whereas it for chameleon folks, it, it seems like that's kind of a progression. And to me, it makes sense. I, I originally came over to reptiles from the saltwater hobby. Okay. And the saltwater hobby is just really intensive. There's a like a they're big time nerds. There's a lot of information and detail. It's very expensive. So people put a lot of emphasis on things and, and they really get down into the nitty gritty. And then when I talk to folks who are into chameleons, who are into dart frogs or day geckos, or like you, you sound like people I already know <laughs> because you, you talk the same and you're, you're so time intensive, dedicated and, and things like that. And then it just seems to be the progression is, well, I learned all these things and I know what I'm doing. I got a system. I'm good at this. And then babies showed up. So then it like, does it, was it a goal to produce them or did you you're developing the husbandry and then it's like, well, boys and girls make more and they're healthy and doing well. So we got more. Like, like, how did that come to be? Right. So, I mean, just the fascination of, of the first Panther chameleon we got, we were, uh, we sat there for hours just watching it, you know, and his name was Ranger. He was a uh, Banja Panther Chameleon. And uh, just we'd watch him and see how he acts and all that stuff. And uh, talked with the breeder. And the breeder kind of explained a little bit to us about what to be prepared for if we decided to breed. And at first we were like, no, we're not going to worry about that. And then uh, I started getting more into the details of, of keeping chameleons, you know, and the, and the fascination of them, where they come from. And then I get in contact with a guy in Madagascar and he starts telling me this wealth of knowledge. And, uh, after that, I was like, well, now I have to breed them. I just, I don't, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't have a choice. And, and now, uh, or at least I didn't feel like it, you know, and, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. Uh, there's, breeders out there that shouldn't be breeding and there's breeders out there that are a great asset to the community. I say if you can't bring something to the table to benefit the animals and or offer an uh, amazing animal then you probably shouldn't breed. You should probably just enjoy the animal. You know we, we don't usually offer females at the shows for sale unless it's by special request. Uh, and most of those go off to friends we know that are breeders, right? Okay. And that's just so people have a chance to think about it. You know, think about it first. Don't, don't well, we just... raise your male first. And that's even what we did. You know, we raised up Ranger to an adult before we even purchased a female. You know, oh, wow. raise okay. your male first. Then see, do you like doing this? Do you like taking care of him every single day? You know, do you want to take care of a female that's a little bit harder to take care of? And, you know, she's not going to give you all the spectacular colors that a male is going to give you. And then, not a great personality. Yeah. but yeah. And then drop you 100 eggs, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, and then you got to deal with all that. It's like, you know, we don't do females. I mean, you know, it shows are the hardest with that because most of the time you go to a show, everybody wants a female of any species. You know, mm -hmm. the females are bigger. The females are better. The females live longer. Well, in panthers, it's completely opposite. 
The yep. females are smaller, they're not colorful, and they don't live as long. The, the longest lived age. female we had, she was six years old. She was a wild caught nosy folly. Yeah, and that, that's unheard and, and, of. And, wow. It, it, we, we could have swore year after year, okay, this is her last year. She's going to die. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Never dropped a gram, nothing. Just just kept on a trucking. And her name was Medusa. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Cool. And fe females are great animals. And just, they're just not for pets. They're, you know, like a pet, single pet owner. Unless you're only going to have a female. If you're trying to get it into Panthers, you know, everybody sees the cheaper price tag, so they want a Panther. But you're, what you're thinking a Panther is and what a female Panther chameleon is is two completely different things. Right. You know, and so we have to explain that once we start explaining it to people, they're like, well, yeah, I didn't want a female panther. I wanted a male panther chameleon. I said, yep. yes, sir. I'm, I'm not discouraging you, but I'm letting you know all the facts to a female. You know, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking whenever a female lives her full life with us as a breeder and then passes away, you know, because of their short life cycles. And, uh, and males live quite a bit longer, you know, five to seven years. We had a wild caught that made it eight years, a male. Uh, wow, cool. And, you know, the shorter life cycles is a little discouraging, but not at the same time, I guess. I guess. Well, we don't have to wheel these animals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Different game. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, we don't have to wheel these animals off. Well, then the majority of the breeders out there, I feel like the price reflects the lifespan. Oh, know? yeah. Sure. You know, like and ball pythons, you know, the, one of the most common snakes bred. Multiple gene, recessive, multiple gene animals go for a whole lot of money. But that's they also live 20 years. Right. You know, uh, and panthers, you know, it's we breed for locale specific. So we right. look how the region, the color phase that comes from that area. We try to get as wild as we can, as yeah. wild looking as we can. We don't want to change and so, it. So we're not trying to create something that doesn't already exist. exist. Yeah. We're just trying to recreate the right. sires that we have. Yeah. We're right. trying to create what you're going to see in Madagascar. We're not trying to create a different color because their genetics don't work the same way like right. that. Well, they're polymorphic, polygenic. Yeah. So. You know, you, you can cross locales all you want together, but you're never going to know what you're going to get. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and then, so now you took a predictable pairing and made something else out of it that you never know what you're going to get. It's kind of nice to have something that's predictable. Yeah. Like, you know? wait, here's the dad. Here is the, you know, the mom's dad. There you go. <laughs> right. You get a variation in between the two. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's important to us. We, we try to breed for wild type look is what we call it. Because there's people out there that sell color morph panther chameleons. And if they want to do it, that's fine. It, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not beating on them or anything like that. As long as they're truthful about the animal they're selling. Yeah. You know, don't, don't, don't have a three locale cross and sell it as an ambulobi. Because then that just hurts everybody in the community. We, right. We, we want to help everybody in the community. We do things a little more traditional on the old school on our hydration methods here. We still daytime mist. Uh, there's a new cycle going around that's the whole fogging deal, uh, which is based off the dry season yeah. in Madagascar, not the wet season. The wet season, it rains. Mm -hmm. It rains quite often. In the dry season, it's foggy at night. Right, yeah, you get the high humidity at night, and then the, the fog banks move in, and then they, it, somehow, in theory, they bring them the fog, and it hydrates them, and that's supposedly how they're supposed to get hydrated, when there's no peer-reviewed writings I can find that show that chameleons have pores in their lungs, right, or, or a way to absorb moisture from breathing like that, and where a snake... When a snake breathes, you know, it naturally has an expanded lung and it has to constrict to force air out of its lungs, mm -hmm. is from my understanding. And, and so in that case, you could see where some humidity or moisture is leaving the animal. 
Well, a chameleon uses kind of its connective tissue on its ribs to breathe. So it's not having to force breathing in or out. So it's not expelling that much moisture out of its mouth. Uh, probably a little bit. And the high humidity at night helps, but not necessarily. I don't think fogging, at least in this region, is as important. And we do a misting in the morning and a misting around late afternoon, enough time for the cage to dry out before nighttime. Okay. And it works really well. The hydration on our chameleons, all our urates look amazing. The chameleons, I've, we've been doing this 14, 15 years, and I have <laughs> never had an upper respiratory infection. Oh, wow. Well, that's awesome. Well, I, we've never had anything that, you know, right. people are having, at least seems like now. And it, it has to be back to something. Well, and it, could, it could be that they're doing the process wrong, right? Because there, there's other... There, there's other ways to keep a chameleon healthy. They're very resilient animals. They're very adaptive animals. Look at the deforestation in Madagascar. A lot of people, you know, they say, well, these fog banks and stuff like that are the hydration, and they're living in second growth forests. Well, the guy I talked to 10, 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't that bad. So maybe... Right. Maybe my information I absorbed from a man living there is a little different than the information that they're absorbing now in a deforestation type environment. Yeah, that actually makes a ton of sense considering how Madagascar is going. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, the the guy I knew he go he frequently visit like satellite islands like Nosy Polly. He owned land on there. He owned land over there by Ambonje. He owned land over there on the east coast. Uh, and so he experienced these dry and wet seasons year round. And he was the one who told me, oh, well, you know, they don't need to. The, the thing was, oh, you got to keep them wet all the time when, whenever we first got into this. Mm -hmm. They're like, no, you don't, you don't keep them like a fish. Don't keep them like a frog. They need, they need water to drink and a humidity spike. And then they need to dry out. And then they need to dry out. They are dry shedders. Yep. And, and he was explaining all this to me. He goes, you know, it only rains in the morning over here. Uh, where was he? He was in Abanja at the time. He goes, over here in Abanja, it's only raining in the morning during the, during the rainy season. And uh, I was like, okay, well, I'll apply that. I'll just do morning and evenings. And so I started doing morning and evenings. I started seeing the chameleons more actively drinking. The urate's looking better. And then on top of that, at the same time, I'm changing my gut loads. And so now I'm getting perfect urates versus a little bit of an orange urate. They look like white chalk sticks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so I started putting two to two together and I was like, okay, so we're seeing them actively drink during the day. So that means that that, and that's during the thriving time of year, right? So mm -hmm. during the rainy season. So if you didn't offer a misting while the animal was you know, away, it's never going to get a chance to drink, right. you know, so I'm thinking that would be like putting you in your bed and turning on a fogger over your bed and saying, okay, now in the morning when you wake up, you can't have anything to drink. You can, you've already got, you drank all night long, you know, by breathing in moisture. Yeah, and it's and like, that's sad. And it could be applications. I'm interested to see where that hydration method goes. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there trying it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not against it, but I'm not saying I'm for it until I see maybe some peer review biologist sure. backed information. You know, I'm very factual. I like I like stuff that is in black and white, black and white, pr proving the theories that are, they're putting out there. Sure. And, and I see people having great success with it, but then I also see the opposite side of the spectrum of that too, where they're having horrible experiences with it, which could be the execution of it. Maybe they're not executing the procedure right. But I have I have a simple method that many chameleon breeders have been doing for a long time, and it, and it keeps the animals healthy. I don't, I, I don't see any health issues. I'm not seeing any... I'm not seeing a big difference. Why, why is there such a, a force to try to change something to the other way that is in the worst time of their environments, the dry season, whenever you can just simulate what their thriving hatching times are, which would be the rainy season. 
Well, yep. in captivity, we can make them thrive, not just survive. So why, you know, give them the hardest part of their life when you can just provide them the best part of their life? Because it's not affecting their feeding habits. It's not affecting their breeding habits. You know, and, and they're doing well. And some species may benefit from the fogging, but I feel like anything getting blasted with micro particles of water isn't good. I mean, because of the bacteria growth, right? So you get bacteria growth 60 degrees and up. It doesn't matter. So, I mean, you're going to have to keep that animal cold, cold at night to be able to not get bacteria growth in the cage. Yeah, so, cold and wet. And it's just yeah. like... Oh, this doesn't sound right. <laughs> and so keeping a, an enclosure at 70 degrees and a fog at night, it, sounds, it just sounds like you're putting a lot of bacteria in the cage that isn't needed. Now, there's people that are doing it success, successfully. So I can't, I can't knock the fact that some people seem to be doing it some way that what I'm seeing isn't working, which is awesome. But I, I'm not seeing the need for it because what you could do is add live plants to your room or a, or a humi cool mist humidifier or a cool mist humidifier to the room not directly in the chameleon's cage blasting in the cage uh, I'm, a, I'm a little confused on that that part of yeah where I, and i'm still going back to if it, if it ain't broke don't fix it <laughs> you know i get it <laughs> so you have listed off uh several different localities um is there, is there a specific set of localities that you go for? Is there, did you, let me rephrase that. Did you start out with localities that you liked or did you see, oh, I really like this look. Where is that from? I, I would like to recreate that look. So I, I know that's a, you know, a banja. I know that's a, like how, did, how, did, how did that come to be for you? So it started out with, how it looked you know she she really liked the way in bonjas look the blues and the greens the red and then uh it, it just it fascinated her and i started looking into it i was like okay well what is an in bonja? you know what, what what is it what is it well it's a regional look and uh i was like okay well that's pretty neat well it's a regional look it's a locality so then i'm like all right well what other localities are out there so then we start looking around and how many locales are there? Oh, no, 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 I think there's, uh, it changes all the time. Originally, it started out like 30 or 32. I think we're way past that now. I think we're into the 40s now. Uh, and that's from like Satellite Islands, like Nosy Folly, you know, Nosy right. Deep, Deep Comba, Nosy Mitzio. And then you got Mainland Islands, which are Ambelovi, Ankerme, Ankafi. Zimbabwe and Bonja, yeah, and Diego Suarez. I mean, the list goes on and on. And uh, we just, there's certain colors that we just enjoyed that we saw from wild caught pictures. And we were like, wow, wouldn't that be amazing to reproduce in captivity? Well, like when people come up to us to buy from us, they're like, well, I don't know which color to pick. It's too hard. And it's like, well, what's your favorite color? Yeah. So, so our, our main focus is Mbonjas. Now I'll go for, so there's a sub-locality in Mbonja called Mbalto. So that's the northern farthest part of Mbonja before a river system hits that splits into Ambalobi because it's all natural barriers that make these oscillations of locality. Yep. And Olaf Pronk was the one who helped me figure out this, what we consider a sub-locale, which is in Balto, which is found in the town of Mbalto in the region of Mbanja. And it's a cleaner colored body animal, a little more on the blue side with red bars. Uh, cool. And so that, that's kind of our main focus in our in Bonjos is that more of an isolated in a region of Madagascar look is going for that look. And then we do Simbabas because we always wanted them, uh, couldn't find them when we first got into chameleons. And uh, I had the chance to get my hand on a captive bread male and jumped all over it. I, I, I 
I had to get a usual I deal with wild caught, but I saw somebody produce a captive bred Simbava, so I had to jump all over it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got Simbavas because I've always been fascinated with the color. And then Nosy Folly is, it was talked to me a, a lot about by the man who lived in Madagascar and it fascinated me. So I had to, I had to get a pair to see what all the hype was about. So Nosy Follies, they have a white background mm -hmm. and uh, their, their slang name, I guess, is called Oriamana, which in Malagasy means red rain. Uh, because they have red polka dots, yeah, and, right? and then they have blue teal bars. It's like a turquoise bluish color with like a white body. And and it's a very neat, neat locality. Uh, he told me a theory he had on how that locality even came to exist because he's owned property on Nosy Folly since the early '60s, and never saw him in on that island until about the mid to late 80s and the mid to late 80s a tropical storm came up the coast of africa and blew outwards and he thinks that what he was seeing if he can remember remembered back that far was he saw nosy bees which are to the south of that island nosy mm -hmm. Pumba, which are south of that island and Coastal and Banja and Baltos on that island. But that was when he didn't have an established building to live there yet, so he could only frequent it kind of rarely. And then come towards the mid to late 90s, all of a sudden you're starting to see nosy follies. So we're wondering if that's kind of a natural cross. A natural cross, right? Because they all got blown onto that island from a big tropical right. storm that happened. It was, it was always a very interesting theory to me, and it, and it kind of drew me more towards the locality because I was like, oh, well, that's even cooler. You know, I got I to gotta see what all this is. <laughs> <laughs> well, and just, just the idea that, like, most of us are hearing those stories or, like, we're reading about it in a book. Like, if you're talking to a dude, like, right, no, yeah. it's this guy's yeah. backyard. Yeah. <laughs> like that's yes, yeah it, yeah it was his backyard i mean yeah that's amazing and and, and, I, and i learned so much from the guy and i wish he was still alive he didn't pass away uh i was but, gonna ask how old this dude was because you're talking about like well when i had a place there in the 60s and it's like whoa dude <laughs> he was old but he got sick it was yeah he got sick uh from what i heard was he died from the black plague but we don't know. I mean, but I could never get a confirmation. Not like he posted that. that you know? Right. Sure. <laughs> sure. And and but I mean, just dude, dude was fascinated with wildlife, all wildlife, and, and plants. And he he was big into plants. Oh, always very uh, taking pictures of plants more than he did reptiles. <laughs> I mean, and he's just a wealth of knowledge to me because I, you know, I wouldn't even be asking a question about chameleons, but he's talking about this plant and how this environmental change is happening in this part of Madagascar and how it makes the plant bloom this way or that way. I'm like, well, okay, so this environmental change to happen, what, what's, what's happening to the chameleons in this area? Right. He goes, oh, I didn't even think about that. You know, I'm worried about the plants. Yeah. And so he goes back and he observes the chameleons in that area. And we're talking, you know, he has to go all the way to a, the service out there. It was horrible. So it was just whenever he could get a hold of me, I had to be ready to answer on the phone. And anytime he called, I answered. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And uh, some would be through emails, you know, and, and stuff like that. And just his attention to detail, I felt, helped us out tremendously. Yeah on how we take care of our animals you know and i would ask him personal opinions you know i'll be like well you know we're doing it this way what do you think and he goes well, you know i've never thought of it that way you know i'm observing them in the wild let me watch it for a little while i'll tell you what i think you know and like the whole super worms is a bad feeder right because too much chitin too much crunch too much crunch you know <laughs> is, what, is what everybody says well 
they're eating a lot of grasshoppers in Madagascar and a lot of beetles in Madagascar. That has a whole lot more crunch and chitin to it than a superworm. Mm -hmm. So a superworm isn't a bad feeder. It may be nutritionally poor, but you can change that. Right. And, and you know, it was little things like that. We just talked back and forth on and, and I just, I, I, say some things to him he'd say some things back to me and it just helped us tremendously on, on understanding common sense things you know that should just be duh but until you kick it back and forth with somebody that has the same amount of passion you're kind of <laughs> at a loss. so that's the reason why i kind of post some of the stuff on instagram and stuff like oh i'm making this dry gut load or i'm gut loading with papaya tonight and mustard greens uh and or this night I'm gut loading with mango and apple or this night I'm not offering any fruits and I'm doing spaghetti squash and yeah. uh, zucchini, you know, and it's, it's just mixing it up. And, and that's part of him helping me understand the, the dietary variation the bugs consume over there. Right. You know, I mean, there, there's there's agricultural land over there that was due to deforestation, and I mean, there's bugs eating that agricultural right. land. Yeah, and, I mean, it's, and yeah, to have, you know, boots on the ground to tell you, you right. know, and oh it's, yeah, it's it's a bean field. Like, yeah, I mean, like, like right. that person, yeah. you know, is it's giving both, you a real time right. change. And some of the videos and stuff I've seen from Madagascar, yeah, there's a lot of secondary growth now. There's a lot more deforestation than whenever I, we were really heavy into kicking back and forth our information. Right. Uh, and so I feel like the animals were probably more evolved and adapted to the primary growth forest versus these secondary growth lines that they're growing in in man-made agricultural areas. Yeah. So I'm going to stick with my older information as far as hydration and nutritional factors because I feel like it meets more of their evolutionary standard before man got involved. I mean, that that makes sense. I, I get what you're saying on that. Um, I do, since... I got some gumbo folks floating through the chat there. Uh, I do want to ask you guys about the show circuit in Texas because I hear all about it and I hear about Texas people and you guys have a ton of reptile shows and it's awesome. Um, and then I see, you know, you guys post on Instagram and, and show your setups and stuff. So um, what's, what's that all about? What's that like? How's the Herp show circuit? How's, how's the Texas reptile show? life uh shows are honestly our favorite thing to do for chameleons because we can get right there and talk to you face to face and you know really show you why it's not this hard you know and like people will walk by and i'll hear them mumble under their breath no chameleons are too hard keep going and i stop them you know, he gets mad sometimes. Yeah. He's yeah. like, stop least listening to people's conversations. Yeah. I'm like, quit eavesdropping. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm, you know, I mean, I want to educate. You know, that's what we're about is we want to educate people that, no, they're not hard. Honestly, a bearded dragon can be harder. You know, it's just setting them up right, right. the first time. Just like anything else. You know, you can't put an isopod in sand and that's you know that's all it is and you know we stop people a lot and change their mind you know and a lot of our customers are people that said no you know chameleons are too hard and now their chameleons are huge and thriving and <laughs> you know doing great I mean, right. and they're like wow you know i didn't know you know that i was felt so lied to and our biggest tip when people ask us, what is your biggest tip for somebody wanting to get into chameleons? Stay off of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> That's your biggest tip. Oh, right. Tip. You're my but, kind of people. Okay. Those, <laughs> it, it, those Facebook groups will scare you yeah. to death. You yeah. know, they will uh, yeah. just you run know, it. <laughs> I, I, this, this is a passion for me. 
and I've, I've absorbed a lot of knowledge. I do a lot of my own research, but I still don't consider myself perfect. But then you see people that have two years of experience raising one chameleon and then they call themselves a group expert trying to tell everybody else how to take care of their chameleons. Yeah. That's not right. We I mean, get banned <laughs> off a lot of groups, <laughs> you know, because we don't do it the way they want to do right. it. And I try to tell people, look, a chameleon is like so versatile, you know, it's, right. it's not yeah. that they blend in, it's that they fit in. Right. You know, so it's like cooking an egg. You can cook an egg a ton of different ways. Yeah. You can raise a chameleon a ton of different ways. If you want to put full, thick foliage, all live plants, go right on ahead. Yeah. It's going to live. Yeah. You know, just if make you, sure and care for the animal and yeah, not, the, not plants. the cage. You know, but I mean, yeah. if that's what they want to do, do it. And we try to tell people to start out our way and raise your chameleon up. Get comfortable taking care of him. Then, you know what? Add a plant. Right. Add another plant. Add another plant. You know, and then you'll learn how to take care of the animal first, not the cage. But the Facebook groups are terrible. <laughs> so, I like being at shows because I can tell you face-to-face, -face, show you Chandler. I set his show cage up just like his home cage is set up. It's just built backwards. You know, but I tell everybody, this is it. Set them up like this when you get them home. Yeah. They're going to be fine. And then add a plant later if you want. Or don't, because yeah. we don't have any. And our animals do just fine. But shows, it's for education. Yeah. And, and I, some of the funny things I hear about shows and chameleons. Yeah. Like I had somebody walk by the other day at the last show we were at. They're like, oh, yeah, chameleons, you can't touch them. The oils in your skin will make them sick and they'll die. And I'm like, no. That's, that's new. Okay. <laughs> like, okay, come over here. Let, let's just talk. I'm not going to argue with you, but but just just let me let me talk with you for a minute. You're thinking of some frog species yeah. that can't really be free-handed because of potentially soaps on your hands and stuff like that that will make them sick. And and so you're you're talking about two different complete two completely different species you know and like we tell people you know there's nothing can prepare you for taking care of a chameleon but a chameleon yeah. you can't take care of a leopard gecko a leopard gecko and expect to be able to take care of a chameleon you have to be able to take care of a chameleon to take care of a chameleon yeah that's because yeah. we hear so, the whole oh well if I, I have, if I don't have reptile experience i can't own a chameleon but, that's why we don't say expert. You know, they're not at expert level. We call them beginners. We started with them. And they're, they're just, I mean, they're, they're specific. They're specific. You know, yes. and, and that's a lot of what we do at the shows. I, I enjoy the shows too. For the education alone. Right, I mean, yeah. it's, I'm, we're trying to break the stigma. Yeah. You know, we, um, we do a lot more talking and communicating with people. If y'all see us at a show, come on down. We'll talk to you. That's uh, it. We'll talk to you the whole yeah, day. <laughs> we don't. We do not mind talk, talking no. about chameleons. You know, selling chameleons is only it's a, a bonus, sm a small portion <laughs> of the <laughs> reason why we do shows. Yeah. And then I hate shipping them because I am terrified all night long, all morning long, until that animal is there. It's like, I, what if the plane blows up? You know, it's like, that's all I'm thinking about the whole time. So that's another reason I like doing shows because I can see the animal in the owner's hands going home, yeah, not I'm, you I'm know, on boat. a plane and a truck and you know, it's terrifying. Yep. I agree with that. <laughs> Shipping is so scary. Yeah. And we do ship animals. <laughs> we do ship them, but I'm yeah. terrified. All yeah. It's, we're, we're, we're probably watching the, uh, the FedEx notifications more than the people receiving the yeah, animal. Yeah, because I'm like, uh. the plane is going to blow up. That's yeah. it. It's like yeah. I'm terrified. Yeah, or so, or, you know, a flat tire on an 18 wheel or, yeah. or, or this or that or some, some something's going to stop this chameleon from getting to the getting to the home. person. So yeah. we, we always overdo it in the packing. You know, we always do like an extra cryo pack to hold the temperature more neutral in there. So if the heat pack fails or the cold pack fails, it holds a neutral temperature in there longer. And I always do, I call them Gatorade. So yeah. a hornworm during that whole first, you know, if we're shipping say on like a Wednesday, 
then Monday and Tuesday, I'm feeding that chameleon extra silkworms, extra hornworms. I'm getting it super hydrated, okay. you know, super fed up. And, you know, people will be like, oh, my God, they're like, poop is giant. Oh. Because, you know, I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, I'm, I planned I'm it that way. You know, in case they get stuck, at least they got something in there. Or like yeah. one where they were like, well, he's hydrated. And they sent us a picture of him still in his shipping container. And he has his big old urate and poop next to him. He goes, well, he's definitely hydrated. I said, well, that was, that was the goal. Hey, yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, I'm worried, so I make sure I give them their extra Gatorade and, you know, their extra get prepared for your trip, you right. know, type of deal. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the shows are a blast. Yeah, we, we love we, it. We meet so many great people. And, and some people that just aren't, they're misinformed on chameleons. Yeah. So so we want to we want to do our best to not, you know, to just share information that is relevant, you know, and, and how we've had experience for 14, 15 years doing this, you know. I mean, yeah. we didn't breed for a, a while. We took a break from breeding, but we still kept chameleons we just weren't out in the community as much which is a little bit of a bummer i was still out in the community but not as much as i would like but you know we were raising our daughter at the time and she's she's 19, 19 going on 20 this year so she she's done and uh it gives us back into our passion to where we can start educating people i love talking chameleons with people and then the man over there in Madagascar shared so much information with me without me even asking. So I feel like it's my obligation to do the same. That's awesome. Because otherwise the knowledge is lost, you know, then, then, then you just don't know. Well, and you know, like if you've seen us on Reptile Gumbo podcast, the, <laughs> they're always like, nope, we're not buying a chameleon. Oh, nope, yeah. nope. And I said, you do know everybody yeah. is a future potential customer. Yeah. Guess what? He's up here yep. waiting to go home. <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, James Lewis in the chat just said we can't wait yep. to get it from him in a few weeks. I know. He's staring down at me right now. Yep. He says, what are you going to feed me? Yep. <laughs> With his big old head. He's chunky. Yep. <laughs> He's going to be going home soon. But that's what I tell him. I said, everybody, because you just never know. I mean, we've had people come up to us at shows and we sit there and talk to them and talk to them and talk to them and think we're never going to see them again. And then boom, the next day they're like, okay, I went home. I set up a cage. I'm ready. Yeah. You know, you made <laughs> me feel like I can do this, you know, like, okay. Right. You know, that is <laughs> awesome. we, we seem like some of the shows, you know, we'll talk to people and then they're like, okay. And they email us, Hey, what's the next show you're doing? Yeah. And then next thing you know, they're showing up at the next show asking us more questions, which is fine. Or they're there to purchase a chameleon. We weren't even trying to sell them a chameleon. We were just talking chameleons with them. And, and it intrigued them. Yeah. And most of the time I have my care sheet posted on our website. And so what I do is I'll tell people, I'm like, look, go home, read my care sheet. Tell me if, you know, if you want to come back tomorrow, then you can tell me if it sounds easy enough for you. And sometimes they come back and they're like, oh my God, I didn't, I had, you know, they had all this negative in their mind that chameleons are terrible. They're made of glass. They're too hard to take care of, you know, and it's just like, no, you just, you've heard the wrong information. Stay off of Facebook. <laughs> That's the, just stay off of there. And I try to stay on the group so I don't start anything to get myself banned. But I watch for my customers. Right. And like okay you know i want to see if you're making a comment or asking a question and boom i'm going to message you and i'm going to answer it because right you know, sometimes it just gets to where you know they want to ask these questions and they don't think well i don't want to you know bother you i'm like please bother me all day right. long do yeah. not bother facebook groups because you're going to get information that is going to scare you and we don't want to scare you, you know, we want you to be, you know, comfortable with it, you know, and if it's a stupid question, in my opinion, there is no such thing as a stupid question. If you thought of it, then you thought of it. So you ask it, you know, yeah. I have had questions that are weird, you know, but they're not stupid. They're just, you know, you just wanted to know. 
Oh, uh, did you give in to the pressure from the chat? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what you see? <seen? laughs> That's Mufasa, so that would be the daddy to <laughs> their baby now. Right. You, amazing. Yeah. Who are you mad at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, so then that that's a Simbaba Panther chameleon. That is crazy. And he is a sire to James and Katie's yep. baby. Her yeah, he almost almost him. looks fake. <laughs> yeah, he's So crazy. I'm gonna say something now, since the gumbo folks are in the chat, I'm gonna take some credit because I met them. And did some podcast stuff and whatnot. And all I heard was, oh, I only do snakes. I don't want things with legs. And I don't want to feed stuff bugs and all this nonsense. And then it turns out, oh, your wife and daughter think lizards are cool, huh? Yeah. And you talk to this lizard nerd. Now all of a sudden we're getting lizards. And now you have like the coolest lizard ever. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking some credit for that one. That's, <laughs> I think I helped encourage Katie to overrule James and get an awesome lizard. Oh, yeah. Dude, yep. that that looks, there's literally a fire lizard. On, it looks ridiculous right now facing out at the camera. That's amazing. Right. Yeah, and it's all like that. That's a Simbaba. I'll let her hold him. Hello, everybody. And I'll go get a Nimbonja. That is so incredible. Well, it's a good thing the oil on your skin isn't going to kill him. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that, no, I, I do like that you, you know, the whole no stupid question thing is. Yes. Yeah. It's, no. it's, it's one of those things where, because I've had actually had some folks talk to me and a few of the folks, uh, the Herpeticulture Network guys. And they they do the well. How do you how do you know that? How do you know all that? You, you asked. Know? Yeah, and it's just I read a bunch of books. I you know I was a forum nerd back in the day. I read a bunch of reptile magazine. Like you just took in all this information. It took a really long time. Like it's not a stupid question. You just genuinely don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. You just don't, you just don't know. And you won't know until you ask the question, you know, look at how orange and yellow he is. Oh man. <laughs> See, and they're not mad at us. They're just mad at each other. Yeah. They're, right. they're some free animals. That is beautiful. And so, you know, I can trust that he's not going to bite me and I can make him you know, calm down. You're just by pushing that. No, we're not going to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I will say, though, that looking at them sitting on your hands, I do understand when folks come by at a show and think that it's gigantic or think that it's huge. Because if you're used to the deli cup, not so great, yeah. you know, wild caught kind of looking grubby thing. And then you see a legit healthy male chilling on somebody's hand. Like it's, it is significantly more impressive, you know, just in general. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And then, so that's Chandler. That's, that's the one that gets all the shows with us. Yeah. He gets, he, he, uh, he likes that tough every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes back in his cage and he's, he's just fine. Puppy dog came. That's why we take him to shows because also that he is so tame. He will let kids, little kids hold him and grab him on his back, you know, and you're not supposed to do that. But he, I mean, I've just held him so much as a baby and messed with him so much that he just doesn't care. Well, so that's the thing with my wife and I doing all the shows that we do is, you know, you start the show and, and you give the rules like, hey, you know, don't grab or this, that and the other. And then, you know, a toddler or some kid will, they always do because they're kids. Yeah. And I get the parent. It's like, oh, no, ah, I'm so sorry. And it's yeah. like, all right, well, like I gave the kids the rules, but I wouldn't have brought, you know, I brought a tegu. Like they can take it. Don't worry about it. Like you, you pick the animal that like can deal. Yeah. You know what and, I mean? Yeah. That you can trust the most. Yeah. You know? And also, you know, we just know that. 
Chandler does so well at shows because I mean he literally got we just did five weekends in a row of shows and oh, he wow. went single one of them did fine you know still nice and healthy eats drinks at, at the show you know I mean and it's like I really feel like a healthy animal you know is going to be able to handle the quote stress you right. know of a show because sure. everybody's like oh well, how do you know if he's stressed out and I was like well you know, he's eating and drinking and, you know, living life in there. I don't think he would do that if he was stressed. Yeah, especially something like Chameleon that's so visual. I mean, yeah. you, they they yeah. would react poorly mm -hmm. if they f were stressed out or feeling yeah. poorly. Like, you yeah. you know, it's very obvious. It's You can see it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like it's and that's why with like new owners, when there's something wrong, there's something you didn't see then. You know, right. a couple of days ago, was he shutting his eyes? You know, was his eyes sucked up into his head a little bit? You know, what's going on that you didn't see? Yeah. You yeah. know, because it's there. You just didn't see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're like, this is one of the juvenile babies we have. So that's one of Chandler's nephews. Yeah. I want to bring one of those boys out. But he says, I don't want to fight him. He's too little. Oh. Yeah, see, he's not, he's not too, and, and the juveniles, they know, you know, hey, that, oh, that's, of course. That, that's not my, my deal, I'm leaving, Yeah, you know, but I mean, but I mean, they're not stressed, it's just, yeah, you know, that's the defensive thing that he's doing, he's like, look, I'm big, bad, and tough, and then he'll go in his cage and he'll eat right away. Well, and you that's, know? that's a natural reaction, <laughs> like, right. oh, that guy's big, I gotta go. <laughs> like that's, yeah. you know, yeah, 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 but you know, they're not these fragile things. Everybody says, Oh, well, they, you know, they'll stress out, they're gonna have a heart attack. No, they're not, they're not right glass, they're right. they're they're very resilient animals, yeah. <laughs> and and there is a huge difference between you know, the a natural stressor of. Uh, I saw another male and and I postured up, or you know, just yes. the things that. Well, Those animals and, are built to do. Yes. You know. And we try to tell people, you know, like who just have one, you know, one male. We'll say, you know what? Because they're like, oh, they're not supposed to ever get stressed out. No, show them a mirror every once in a while. Because we're believers in that if they see another male, because they don't know how a mirror works. They think it's another male. And I think that it kind of sparks that drive in them. You know what? I need to eat. I need to take care of myself because there's a male around this corner somewhere. Yeah, competition. You know, yeah, yeah, in my territory. So I need to be healthy. I need to be on my game. You know, oh, yeah. and tell people every so often, show them, show them the mirror. You're going to get a great picture. Yeah. You know, you're going <laughs> to get a picture that you're not ever going to get in a different mood. Yeah, but for sure. Make them mad, you know. Like Mufasa is typically green; he's not yellow. But whenever he's mad at another male, is when he turns that yellow on. Sure. And you know, it's yeah. I think it really just you know creates that spark for territory. You mm -hmm. know, I need to take care of myself because there could be somebody around the corner that I got to fight. Yeah. And yeah. you know. Well, I mean, dude. Even there are any number of snake species that males get lazy. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then you got to introduce another or even just a shed for a male or you got to let them know like, hey, man, if you don't go for her, there's somebody else cruising around. Like, that's it. You, you got to <laughs> kick it a little bit to make that instinct want to go. Mm -hmm. Well, like I see people with uh, captive bred males. Sometimes I'll say, well, my male won't breed. Well, how have you been caring for your male? Oh, well, I'm just, you know, the standard husbandry, however they're doing it. I'm like, but has he had to try to do anything? Has he tried to defend himself? You know, has he shown him a mirror? I don't and, need to make babies. I got a great life. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he basks, he eats, he roams around his caves. There ain't no threat. Why, why reproduce? Yep. You know, I, I don't need to. Yep. <laughs> And sometimes that happens with the chameleons. You know, they, they get comfortable and they're that comfortable in their environment. And 
they don't have any stressor of seeing an old male or seeing their reflection and they're like well i have no reason to flare up yeah apparently my <laughs> territory is mine yeah. and yeah. i don't worry about it <laughs> you know yeah i mean that's <laughs> absolutely but you know for feeding we tell people it's even if you're not breeding them it's great because they are going to keep their energy level up right you know they're thinking oh no there's a male you know in here somewhere you know they are going to keep their energy level up because they may have to fight tomorrow right yeah. well like in the wild you know the, the strongest survive in the wild you know and usually the strongest encountered another chameleon and they saw that chameleon and said oh that's big i'm leaving and I'm gonna go get that big. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I. That makes perfect sense. And <laughs> sometimes that's all it is. It just, you know, think of them on the basic, just survival animalistic method you can. Yeah. You know, and then you're like, wait a minute, that's easy. You know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, just kind of kind of dumb it down a little bit for yourself. No, and, just don't don't overthink it. Yeah, we tell people all the time, stop overthinking. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, don't overthink it. Just just step back and look at the animal, observe what the animal's doing. You know, and usually it, the the answer will come to you. You know. Yeah. And they're like, okay, well, yeah, my animal isn't wanting to breed. You know, why is that? Well, it has no threat. You know, or right. my animal isn't isn't eating as much anymore. Well, that could be because you're feeding it the same empty feeder every day, all day. So yep. yeah, it's not it's not getting any any enrichment because you know most reptiles are very instinctual, so they get enrichment off food and breeding and in the environment. So so one of those three things has to enrich them to make them want to continue to do what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm glad I, I've got to talk to you guys because that yeah, that's <laughs> and it it's not that it is earth shatteringly different than how other folks are doing it. No. It is it generally kind of falls in the same lines. And then right. you have some very specific things for your stuff. And then, I don't know, it just kind of fits with my philosophy, so it was kind of biased. But, like, you guys are, you're very, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, you know, you observed something and you reacted to it and had good results. And, and you know, you're to me, everything that you have said has been very observational. And you, you got this result and then you moved based on the result. Um, yeah, I, I love that. And then it's ever evolving, you know, I mean, if, if something comes out, you know, every once in a while, I'll look into some of the newer supplements that are coming out and I may end up finding a new supplement other than our supplement schedules we use now. And then I'll start recommending that, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but I, I don't want to stay static you know like like i say you know i learned a lot of stuff from an old school guy and i and some of my methods are old school as in you know day mistings but it works it's proven to work yeah uh, the the outcome speaks for itself i mean we got we have healthy thriving babies with healthy urates they're active they're actively feeding they're, they're we already got them actively reproducing so and producing viable eggs and I mean so so it's speaking for itself and the fact that so a little old school isn't necessarily bad <laughs> you know yep and but some new school isn't necessarily bad either like the light up the new bulbs yeah the light upgrades and then the supplementation I don't use pink repcal anymore I use uh repcal <laughs> but I use the green label, no D3. So it's just yep. plain calcium. That gets fed six days a week. And then one day a week, we feed the Rapashi Calcium Plus Low D because it has preformed vitamin A and a mm -hmm. low dose, uh, low IU of synthetic D3. Yep. And the only reason why I offer that is for the fat soluble vitamin A and the B complex vitamins in there just in case something is lacking in my gut load. And the yeah. synthetic D3 is there 
as a safety net. It's not necessarily there to give the chameleon its D3 requirements. That's what the bulb is there for. Right. And but that's just something that, you know, if a Facebook group heard that, they would lose their <laughs> Yeah. You know, because <laughs> because it's not so, some, some want you to do it twice a month. Once a week, basically, is a death sentence on a Facebook right. group's mind. And so I'm looking at the, the concentration of this dust. And then you put that dust in there with a dozen crickets and you shake it around. How much of that I use is actually of D3 getting on that one cricket? Right. You're not getting the 20,000 I use that the bottle, of, says. That the bottle says of the D3. You're right. Percentage of a percentage of that 20,000 I use on that one cricket, you know? So you're not overdoing it at that schedule. You're yep. still with a very safe parameter to where the chameleon is not going to develop any edema, any fluid buildup, any any liver issues. Uh, we've done whole life cycles, uh, two, three generations with the supplementation schedule without any liver issues, any edema issues. The, That's awesome. And it just works, you know, I mean, and that, that's from observing the animals and adjusting over time, you know, and trying to figure out something simple that will work so it's not complicated. Because when we first got into it, yes, it was complicated because we were getting flooded with a thousand people's opinions, <laughs> you know. And so you got to step back and you got to all right, go to basics and then move up from there. If you want to do, you know. Do a basic setup when you get a chameleon from us and then grow your setup from there. Right. You know, add the live plants if you want to. I don't think live plants are bad. I personally don't want to take care of them. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't have a green thumb. And so this works out better for me and I can keep live plants alive outside the enclosures because I'm not worried about overwatering them. Or under lights or over lights or, or fertilizer. And this and that, you know, and I get to keep my chameleons clean, half, happy, healthy, and the right humidity without having to take care of the plant in their enclosure. Right. But some people love the wild jungle look, and that, that's great as long as you can meet the requirements. You know, so, so you always want your basking spot at around the mid 80s. You want a UVB index of three to three and a half at the top branch. And then you'll want some shaded areas and you'll want levels, stepped levels down to where they can step down on UVB and step down on temperature and then get out of it completely if they want to. Yeah. All very simple. Right. right. It's, and, and it's a lot, but it's simple. Right. right. It's, it's a lot, I guess, to take in all at once. That's the reason why she wrote up uh, the care sheet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like she broke it down well enough to where it's not so overwhelming to somebody when they read it. You know, but sure. I'm working on one now that's going to be an extension of the care sheet, you know, because of all the Facebook groups. <laughs> and it's, you know, I'm basically answering every single question that I have seen asked by either a customer of ours or just a random person. And cool. It, it's going to break it. It's, I'm calling it like beyond the basics, you know, and it, this is where it's going to get intense, you know, but it's going to just point blank tell them. And when I say that, it's I'm not going to tell you, like we had told James and Katie, I'm not going to tell you just yes or no. I'm going to tell you yes and why and no and why. Right. You know, like okay. you don't need to have any nighttime heat on your chameleon even if they can't see the light they need to cool down at night so their body can fully shut down and if you have a heat emitter on them you know it's they're never going to get to shut down right. you know and you know that's i'm not going to just tell you no you can't use it i'm going right. to tell you why too right you know? and that's the education part of how we are is i'm not just going to tell you yes or no i'm going to tell you why Right, yeah. Cool. yeah. Yes or no doesn't answer the question. No, it doesn't. That doesn't <laughs> you know, that, that is an answer, but not an answer to the question. 
and, and right. I feel like an answer to the question is more important than just a yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot, you know, there's a lot of people out there, yes and no. Well, why? Yeah. And, and if you step back and you start asking why, most of the time they can't answer. Right. So and they get banned. And then they start <laughs> questioning, well, now, okay, well, so now you're questioning me. So I'm kicking you off the group. Yeah. Right. It's not that I'm questioning you. I just, it's just I'm, can you give me a reason? I want more information. Yeah. On yeah. Why, or why yes, why no, or only this way. And I can't ever get an answer. It's because they don't have it. You know, right. they're following someone's narrative that, you know, put them in charge that also can't answer it. So we just get banned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sounds very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because most everything I told you about, I, I have an answer for why. You know, just right. like mealworms. Mealworms, the reason why I say no is they're high in the chitin, which I had the discussion about the chitin. But the problem is, is they do not gut load well. Yeah. You, you can leave that thing on a carrot or any kind of gut load I feed them, and they just don't consume enough. Yep material versus the fat and chitin that they have so nutritionally they are poor all around even yep. it's basically yep. a hard twinkie <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've i've found the exact same thing they just they don't eat enough no. for the process to work correctly right. but, but if you'll yeah. take a leafy mustard fresh piece of mustard green and put it in a super worm bin leave it for an hour or two and come back mm -hmm. there's nothing left yep you know yeah, and it's a significant like, difference. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like a hundred worms. And I'm like, okay, yep, those and super worms would cheat too, you know. It's like we just need to stop feeding mealworms are useless. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, that's and that is, you know, just a super basic observation. But yeah, it, it it's it's just the rate that they eat doesn't fit what we all need. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, and then like uh what else is there? The wax worms. Yeah. Wax worms are just fat. That's all they are. <laughs> yeah. And it's like if you're looking to add fat, just and then do some dubias or some every, worms every or... time I've tried to gut load a wax worm, it seems like it never eats anything. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Same. So yeah. I was like, okay, well let's try these black soldier fly grubs. So I grab the black soldier fly grubs, even though they say I don't have to gut load them. I'm gonna go. Load I gut load everything. Yeah. <laughs> so I put food in there, and they destroy it. And I'm like, okay, see, oh, yeah. that will work. Yeah, literally, <laughs> I I put a sweet potato in there, and I pulled it out, and I'm not kidding you. It looked like a lace item, like yeah. a lace handkerchief. You know, yep. it was all pretty intricate lace. You know. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, these things can gut load. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They eat for real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we are cruising past two hours, okay, which is yeah. crazy. Um, <laughs> <didn't so>, like. <laughs> <laughs> we can yak all day. So um, before I wrap things up, I do want to say that in the chat, we had several people come in and say that they bought chameleons from you, oh, which I right. thought was really cool. And uh, very specifically, the people who commented said that they uh, they all were commenting about how healthy their chameleons were, which I thought was really cool because they weren't, it wasn't like, oh, I got a red one or like I got the big one or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like they, they were commenting that they got healthy animals. Yeah. Uh, and it was more than one person that came to comment that. Uh, I thought that was really awesome, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that before I wrap oh, things up. That, that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that was and very cool. That means a lot. That's our goal. <laughs> yeah. So where can people find you to find all this awesome chameleon information? So everything is under Reddy's Rainforest. So Facebook, Reddy's Rainforest, Instagram, Reddy's Rainforest, and then the website, Reddy's Rainforest. Dot com. Cool. <laughs> None of those little underscores and all that stuff. I was lucky enough to grab it all up. <laughs> nice. So for those folks who are listening to the podcast, as opposed to watching here on uh, Facebook or YouTube, I will put a link to the website uh, in the show notes. If you are getting it on a regular podcast app, 
or if you look at it on the Facebook page, it will be in the little comment section with a link to the website. So that was awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming on, and I am glad that the Texas folks recommended you as their resident chameleon nerds. <laughs> hey. Yep, that's like a good it. thing. That's a good thing. That's the goal here is healthy, easy animals. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, yeah. Yep. Thank you for having yeah. us. Oh, yeah. That's Everyone sure. talk yes. to us again. We're always here. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Good night. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> That was awesome. I am so glad that the folks uh, at Reptile Gumbo and the folks on the Herp Circuit recommended them. Uh, I was already kind of social media stalking them uh, to check out their stuff when the Reptile Gumbo folks told me about them and it was really cool. Uh, I love that they give out their recipe for their dry gut load. Uh, they have bunches of pictures of doing different stuff with gut loads on different insects. Uh, they they kind of photo document uh, a lot of the different things that they do, which is really cool. And I think the sterile method that they use is really neat. I was, I was personally kind of fascinated to see that because that's not how I'm used to seeing chameleons set up. And then I watched her video where she set it up. Uh, it was very involved. She explained everything, worked through it step by step. Uh, she did a, a really good job just talking through how and why they do what they do. Uh, and I thought that was amazing. So I'm really glad they, they came on to talk about it and they're having great success with it. So that's really cool to see. Uh, I'd like that they are debating the nighttime fogging thing. Uh, I personally like the idea for the nighttime fogging, but I think it's cool that their debate isn't that it's bad their debate point was that it happens in a different time of year in Madagascar. And so I thought that was really cool because it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong or bad or what have you. It just means that maybe that could be a seasonal thing that you do or you pick. It allows for more options, I think, as opposed to a yes or a no, kind of like they were saying, like not yes or no, but why? Uh, I thought it was really cool how he looked at that and that he thought of it as a time of year issue, not a uh, bad hydration or what have you. Uh, that was a very, a very cool perspective. Um, so as you guys know, I missed an episode in March. Uh, that was actually my birthday and I was driving back from uh, Illinois, uh, from Kansas. So craziness on the road, uh, as evidenced by the fact that I am in a hotel room and have a completely different background than normal. I, once again, am traveling for work. I have everything set, uh, for the next couple of episodes, so we should be good. But the next episode you see me will be in a different hotel room. And then the episode after that will probably be this hotel room again. <laughs> so, uh, lots of different stuff going on. Um, yeah, but that was the, the cause of the missed episode there. Um, as always, black, wait, can I get my hand in place there? Black box cages. Uh, I just got my stack of four foot enclosures, which I'm super stoked to get set up and put together because I was, I'm actually planning out some of the VivTech things and, and trying to use different lighting and heating and UV spots. So I want to, uh, experiment with some of that and show you guys what it is that I was talking about. So that should be a lot of fun. And then... Ooh, speaking of VivTech, I actually have a code with them, which was kind of neat. Erica gave that to me after the episode we did together. And it's Lizard Brain, all one word, capitalized, 2-3. So 2023, obviously. Um, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I enjoy their stuff, and I'm using it to really good effect with my desert things that need high UV. And I'm going to start to experiment more with my turtles. Uh, and things like that. I have them on a few turtle species and they bask super well with those. So I, I've been enjoying that, but I'm going to, I'm going to add to that. Uh, our facility is a little bit bigger than probably most people's. So it's a little bit harder for me to buy like 20 of those at one time. So we're slowly 
uh, increasing the turtle basking from uh, one type of UV to another, but we just, we have a lot. So uh, equipment changes or technology changes for us are a little more expensive. So we do them kind of piecemeal. Um, same thing with, you know, black box. I, I love their stuff and I'm and converting a, a lot of my stuff to their uh, enclosures. But as you guys have heard me talk about Teresa and myself and the family, uh, it's a lot of animals. So those, those enclosure conversions come in sections where my wallet can handle them. So, uh, so yeah, it, it takes a little bit of time, but I'm, I'm having a great time with it. Uh, I really love talking to them and, and seeing their, the stuff that they're coming up with has been really cool. Uh, actually just the stack of the four footers that I have, uh, is a different height. And so the actual layout of the enclosure is a little weird, but it allowed me to do uh, more in the stack and still stop at six feet high. Uh, so for me, when I'm trying to show people in the facility, uh, I don't want to go above six feet just because an average person, my height, like holding a little kid, they can still show them the high up things. Uh, so that our considerations are a little different than most folks probably, but uh, the stuff that Black Box was doing has really helped us with that, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So I will see you guys all again in two weeks. Later.